What's going on all my healthcare professionals? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today we're continuing on with our cardiovascular assessment and electrocardiogram series and we're going to be discussing sinus tachycardia and sinus arrhythmia. Before we begin, I want you to take a look up here on the right side of your screen. You're going to see two different sets of stoplights. Our first set of stoplight is going to tell us about our rhythm. Is it a good rhythm? Is it a rhythm we should be cautious about? Or is it a lethal rhythm? Those not really good rhythms. And our next one is going to be either a green person letting us know that we can play our Monopoly game, collect our $200 and keep going, or it needs to be red, stop, we need to do something about this before it gets worse. So to begin, we're gonna be talking about sinus tachycardia. So the rate of sinus tachycardia is between 100 to 160 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular and is initiated in the sinoatrial node. You're gonna see regular P waves that are preceding QRS complexes. PR intervals are shortened as the rate increases, but the QRS interval is still normal. It's less than that 0.12 seconds. The definition of this rhythm is a rapid heart rate with an increase in the automaticity of the sinus node in response to a stimulus. So one thing we need to look at is, can we determine if this is a true sinus tachycardia for our patient? So to determine that, we take the highest rate of sinus tachycardia in relationship to age, and we use the following equation, 200 beats per minute minus the patient's age in years. This can be useful in judging whether the sinus tachycardia falls within that expected range. So for example, if we have a patient that is 40 years old and is presenting with a sinus tachycardia of 140, we take our equation, 200 beats per minute minus 40 years of age is equal to 160 beats per minute maximum. So our patient has not yet reached his or her maximum tachycardia, but still falls in that sinus tachycardia range. So what are some causes that we can see with our sinus tachycardias? We could have hypoxemia, shock, pulmonary embolism, anemia, heart failure, hypovolemia is a big one. If there's a compromise in stroke volume, the heart rate will increase. Heart rate and stroke volume have an inverse relationship. So that's something important to know when you're looking at hemodynamics. Myocardial infarction, hyperthyroidism, stress, pain, fever can also cause these tachycardias. Medication effects such as atropine, epinephrine, digitalis toxicity, caffeine, and certain drugs such as cocaine can also cause tachycardias. It's important to note that this can actually be normal in some adults as well as some children when we're taking care of our patient populations. So when looking at interventions for sinus tachycardia, we really want to treat the underlying cause and correct the contributing factors. If cardiac function is poor, cardiac output can be dependent on the compensatory tachycardia. So returning the heart rate to normal when our heart rate is dependent on that tachycardia can actually be detrimental to patient outcomes. Lastly, let's take a look at that sinus arrhythmia. So the rate of these sinus arrhythmias will be normal. They'll be between 60 to 100 beats per minute. But what makes this different is the rhythm will be irregular, but it's still initiated by that sinoatrial node. P waves will also be regular. They'll be preceded by the QRS. And the PR interval will be between 0.12 to 0.2. That's normal. And our QRS will be less than 0.12 as well, which is also normal. So the definition of this is there is an impulse that is generated in the sinoatrial node at irregular intervals due to the effects of the vagus nerve caused by respirations. So outside of respiration causes, what else can cause these sinus arrhythmias? Myocardial infarctions, sick sinus syndrome can cause this, chronic lung disease, it's a respiratory thing, think chronic lungs, right? Digitalis toxicity, as well as an increase in intracranial pressure, ICP. Again, this can be normal in our well-conditioned adults as well as our children. So how do we treat this? What interventions are we looking at? Treatment interventions are based on symptoms as well as hemodynamic instability. If treatment is necessary, we're gonna treat it based off what we treat our sinus bradycardias with. That's our atropine, our transcutaneous pacing, dopamine, and epinephrine. 
To begin, we have atropine. That is our first drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardias. It can also be used in our AV nodal blocks. However, there really hasn't been shown any benefit to our second degree type two heart blocks as well as our third degree complete heart blocks. You may still see it, but it just might not show benefit. So atropine dosing, 0.5 milligrams IV every three to five minutes, not to exceed 0.04 milligrams per kilogram with a maximum of three milligrams. Considerations for atropine, it can cause myocardial oxygen demand, so we have to be cautious if there is myocardial ischemia or hypoxia present when providing this to our patients. Lastly, it's important to note that atropine can cause paradoxal slowing. So sometimes instead of bringing the heart rate up, it can actually make it worse and slow it down further. So we need to prepare to pace these patients in case that paradoxal slowing does occur. Talking about transcutaneous pacing, this is not fun for our patients, especially our conscious patients. So for unstable bradycardias that are less than 50 beats per minute with some kind of compromised hemodynamics. So what is that? That could be hypotension, acute altered mental status changes, shock, ischemic chest discomfort, as well as our acute heart failure patients. So what do we usually pace when we do transcutaneous pacing? Well, we do our symptomatic sinus node dysfunction rhythms, our type two second degree heart blocks, our third degree heart blocks, complete heart blocks, our new bundle branch patients that sh are showing slowing, as well as um, we're not using this for our agonal rhythms or our cardiac arrest. It shows no benefits. Cardiopulmonary CPR, if it's shockable, we're gonna shock. If not, um, we're just gonna give medications and provide CPR. So transcutaneous precautions. Conscious paced patients may require analgesia for that pacing discomfort. Remember, this is uncomfortable for our patients when they're awake because they're constantly being shocked to provide that rhythm, um, to provide that upping of that rhythm for that patient. We also want to avoid palpating carotid pulses to confirm capture. Why do we do that? Because electrical impulses can cause muscle jerking that can mimic a pulse. So if you're checking a carotid pulse, that might not be accurate because of that constant muscle jerking caused by the transcutaneous pacing. So how do we set it up? We're gonna position the pacing pads on the patient as instructed by the packaging. Normally one pad goes over the right anterior chest wall and then the left pad will go on the left midaxillary line next to the heart. We want to turn on the pacer before we do anything else. And we want to set the demand rate to 80 beats per minute or whatever the physician tells you to set it to. We also want to set the current MA output. So an increased current starting with a minimum setting and moving on until electrical capture is consistent, which would be a wide QRS and a T wave after each pacer spike, that means that our patient has ventricular pace, would be something that we want to see. Common current ranges between 50 to 80 MAs. Let's talk about that good old boy dopamine. This is our second drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardia. It's mostly used for our hypotensive patients who have a systolic less than 100 that are also showing signs and symptoms of shock. Something that is very important to note specifically with dopamine is we don't give this medication IV push. Please, please, please never push this medication. It's always given via IV infusion. So dopamine dosing rates initially will be between two to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And we titrate based on the patient's hemodynamics, their blood pressure. Normally we're looking for a systolic rate of greater than 90. Considerations when it comes to dopamine include the fact that we need to correct hypovolemia with adequate fluid replacement prior to starting dopamine. Because this is an IV fusion and not an IV push, we need to make sure that the patient has the adequate volume to move this medication around. We also wanna use it cautiously with our cardiogenic patients, especially our CHF patients. And we need to note that it may cause tachyarrhythmias and excessive vasoconstriction. So we have to be very careful when we're titrating this medication. Lastly, you don't wanna mix this medication with sodium bicarbonate because the fact is sodium bicarb is a very alkaline solution and that can actually deactivate the dopamine 
making it not effective for our patients. Lastly, we're moving on to our epinephrine. It is an alternative drug of choice when it comes to symptomatic sinus bradycardia in place of dopamine when it's contraindicated. So we use this when we're pacing the patient, the atropine fails, and we're starting to have severe hypotension. So for dosing, it's going to be between 2 to 10 micrograms per minute, and we're going to titrate based on that patient's hemodynamics, that blood pressure. We want to titrate that slowly. So epinephrine considerations, rising blood pressure with increasing heart rate could cause angina, myocardial ischemia, and an increase in oxygen demand. So we have to monitor these people very closely. High doses does not improve survival rates. It may contribute to post-resuscitation myocardial dysfunction with poor neurological outcomes. If we have a patient who has been poisoned or is in a drug-induced shock, Higher doses may be necessary to make this medication effective. I hope that this video was helpful in elevating your cardiac knowledge and helping you pass those exams like a boss. Make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where you can get copies of these resources, the PowerPoints, as well as test questions that I will be including with each one of these videos within the series. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions and make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell. Until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I can't wait to see you all again soon. Bye.